go into it with eyes wide open, know the potential downfalls, be prepared to deal with those, and even be prepared to deal with some that you didn't see coming. friends, welcome back to Market Shares. I'm your host, Tony Blodgett. And today, this episode, I think we're gonna call the truth about investing in real estate. But the reality is, is that it's really just gonna be my truths about investing in real estate. Because let's be honest, no one has all the answers. But what I think I can share with you is some perspective and some experience that I've gone through in, in my journey of owning homes, investing in real estate, and being a mortgage professional for the last 26 years and advising people in these different areas. So I hope that this is an episode that you can just uh, kind of listen through um, the journey that I've been on and hopefully glean some ideas, uh, some, some areas that, you know, some pitfalls maybe that I've had over the years um, that can help you with your journey in investing in real estate. Whether you already are a seasoned investor, you're probably going to resonate with some of the things that I talk about. Or if you're just thinking about real estate as an investment, here's some things to keep in mind. So I'm going to rewind the clock all the way back to when I bought my first home. And I want to share this story because I think a lot of people are, especially young people, are challenged with, you know, the, the, the idea of going from being a renter to purchasing a home. And uh, so at the time, uh, I think I was about 20 years old, maybe 21 years old when I bought my first house. And prior to uh, buying the home, I was renting an apartment with, uh, it, was, it was two couples. It was me and my girlfriend, and it was a friend of mine and his girlfriend. So there was four of us splitting the rent and I'm going to date myself here, but the rent was only like $750 a month. And I know that's a pretty small number, um, but we weren't making a lot of money back then. And we were all sharing in that expense. And I was really wanting to purchase a home. I had already started in the mortgage business and it was just a passion of mine to be a homeowner. So I went and tried to pre-approve myself for a home loan and I didn't qualify. So I had this brilliant idea that I would purchase the home with my girlfriend at the time. Now, mind you, we were 20, 21 years old and you know, all relationships in your early twenties are going to last forever. And so I thought, what, what's the harm? And I was cautioned against this idea by many. Um, but nonetheless, we decided to purchase this home. And the first thing that I want to mention is that, you know, I went from splitting a $750 rent payment four ways to the two of us having to pay about a 1400, it was like 1455, something like that was the mortgage payment. So, you know, the payment was double and it was now split two ways instead of four ways. And the first thing that I would mention about it, buying a home is that you'd be surprised at how much you can afford in your budget if you make it a priority. And this is something I talk to home buyers about all the time is especially when you're buying your first home, you know, a lot of people say, well, I pay X amount for rent right now and I, I couldn't pay a dollar more than that. And I always challenge people to really look at your budget and understand maybe you could pay a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe the tax deductibility of your mortgage payment could allow you to increase your deductions on your W-4 and put more money in your pocket every month. Or maybe you're just spending money frivolously and you think that there it's important, right? The things that you're spending money on. Uh, but you might find that if you had your own home, you'd spend more time at home, you'd, you'd you know, want to work on the weekends of, you know, doing projects around the house and you just don't spend as much money. So the first kind of lesson I would say here is, um, you know, you might be able to spend more than you think. And for me, that was the case. I was definitely afraid of my uh, housing expense going up so much, but you know what? I found a way to make it work. And then fast forward, it only took about six months and uh, that relationship that I thought would last forever ended quite abruptly. And uh, me and my girlfriend broke up, she moved out. And now I was in this home uh, by myself having to make that full mortgage payment. 
And uh, luckily, my mortgage career was starting to take off, and I, I found ways of affording that. I think I had a roommate for a while to help bridge the gap and, uh, and, and make it work. But the first thing that I learned is that although purchasing a home with someone that you're not married to is probably not the smartest decision, um, for me, it ended up working out. Now, there was some additional expense. I ultimately ended up refinancing that home and I had to pay excise tax to remove her from title in addition to the normal closing costs for refinancing. So some things to keep in mind if you're going to be purchasing a home and it's not with your spouse, there's some additional expense if things don't don't go well. But as I've shared on this podcast in the past, in my early 20s, I was not great with my um, credit cards and I had a lot of debt. And that home actually afforded me the ability in a couple of years to refinance, consolidate my debt and change forever my relationship with credit cards and how it is that I manage debt. And I would not have been able to do that had I not purchased that home, pushed my budget a little bit, um, and, and realize the appreciation. So that was my first kind of soiree into owning a home. Now, after that, I decided to, uh, I, I was living in a kind of a small neighborhood and I wanted some acreage. And so I bought a much older home and it was on acreage. And, uh, you know, I was excited to get out of this cul-de-sac situation. So I listed my home for sale and it didn't sell, you know, the market had softened a little bit and, uh, I was not able to sell the home for the price that I wanted. And I actually ended up becoming a landlord uh, by accident. I had someone who came to me to purchase that home and they wanted to do a lease option. And my realtor at the time um, explained to me what a lease option was. I had never been a part of that and I decided to do a lease option. And again, got really lucky. That turned out to be a really good deal. They gave me a large uh, down payment. They paid an above market rent and they never ended up buying the home. And so they, uh, I got the home back and kept that as a rental property for many, many years. And so that was kind of my, my first, uh, opportunity to be a landlord. It, it had its challenges and, and I learned a lot from that process, but was able to start building my real estate portfolio a little bit by accident. So then, you know, I'd bought my new house and that was going well, you know, it was much larger. It was kind of more private. It was out on acreage, but I had bought a significantly older home. And I think I underestimated, um, you know, what would be necessary to make this home feel comfortable. And this is one, the first thing I would caution people, if you're buying your first home, a lot of people want to buy a home and I've had people come to me over the years and they want to buy a fixer upper because they really want to build equity and they think that this is a great investment opportunity. So the first lesson I would tell you is that for your first home, especially a home for a young family, um, I wouldn't buy something that's in really rough shape that you have to spend all your evenings and weekends um, just making it habitable and making it livable and comfortable for your family. I think this first step with owning a home is having something that you can come home and be proud of. So just keep that in mind. If you're a first time home buyer is that you're, there might be this, this thought of buying something that's in really rough shape because you can build equity. And I, I think what I learned is that having a home that I can come home and be proud of was more important. Now, this house, that second house that I bought, I owned it for 14 years and I put a ton of money into renovations. I probably over $300,000 in, I did an addition. Uh, I renovated the whole home. It had a basement. I renovated that. I did a lot of outdoor landscaping. And to be honest with you, I made money on that house, but very, very little. And to be honest with you, it never, it just never felt like the home that I wanted it to be. And it was because I, you know, made bad choices when I purchased it. And, uh, and, and despite putting money into it and putting in the granite countertops and updating the cabinets and so on and so forth, it just never had the feel of what I was looking for and uh, ultimately ended up selling that home and purchasing a home that, uh, that I really could feel good about the home that I live in now today. And, uh, and like the last two purchases, it was a bit of a stretch at the time, but I found a way to, to make it work. So, you know, 
what I've learned about your primary residence, first of all, it is an investment, you guys. It's you know, a lot of people these days are like, well, you just got to live somewhere. I would just assume rent because the mortgage payment is going to be more than what I would pay in rent. And if you simply look at it from the cost of rent versus the cost of a mortgage payment in today's market with where home values are and where real estate values are, in some cases, that very well may be true. A mortgage payment may be more expensive, but I think that it's not taken into consideration all of the factors that you need to think about. And for me, I can tell you, I would financially not be where I'm at today had I not purchased uh, a home when I was in my early 20s. And although there's been up and downs in the market, owning that home and being able to use that to purchase my, my next home has been huge for me and my family. And um, I, I wouldn't replace that for anything. So let's talk about investment properties. So like I told you, I kept my first house as a rental and, um, and, and had that for, for many years. And I learned that being a landlord can be challenging. I'm gonna actually do another episode. We're gonna talk all about being a landlord because to me, there's two aspects of investing in real estate. One is the real estate itself right? Uh, owning that property, whether it be something that you live in or something that you're buying as a rental property, or maybe something you're buying as an investment because you're going to fix it up and, and flip it. And in which case you wouldn't be a landlord in that case. But to me, they're two separate things. Owning and buying real estate is one thing. Being a landlord is a completely different animal and something that I think requires its own level of examination and consideration if you're going to do that. So fast forward, you know, I was in the mortgage business now for a few years and I decided that I was going to be a real estate investor. So around 2006, now if you know anything about the financial crisis, you know this was not great timing, but around 2006, I started purchasing some investment properties. And uh, I actually purchased three homes between 2006 and 2007. And I'll be honest with you, the big mistake that I made, and I should have known better, was I looked at the appreciation of these homes. I didn't give a whole lot of consideration to the cash flow aspect of these investments because I'm like, look, even if I buy them and the mortgage payment is $2,000 and I can only rent it out for $1,800, well, that's only $200 a month that I have to cover but look at what the values are doing in real estate. And so I made my primary determination based on future appreciation of the property. And that was a huge lesson because as you guys all know, in 2008, really in 2009, as the financial crisis hit, home values tumbled. And I found that the properties I had just purchased were as much as 50% of the value that I had paid for them. And boy, was that a sobering experience to be in my now, you know, early thirties. Uh, I had just bought all this real estate thinking that I was on top of the world. I was going to be a real estate investor, like all the people that are, you know, selling these programs and talking about how you can never lose with real estate. And, and here I am over a million dollars in negative equity in the real estate that I owned. If you include my primary residence and that first home that I'd bought as a, as a rental. And it was, um, it was a scary time. Now, luckily I was making good money in the mortgage business and was able to keep all those homes. There was a lot of people who did strategic foreclosures during that time. And, uh, I felt very passionate about, um, you know, the fact that I'd bought these homes as long-term investments. And that would be another lesson that I would want to impart in you is that, you know, when you purchase a piece of real estate, you have to think, you know, is this my primary residence? If it is, how long do I plan on staying there? Is this an investment property? How long do I plan on owning this property? What is my strategy to purchase it, rent it out? And, and where do I want to exit? Uh, these are things that I would give a lot of consideration to before you move forward with a purchase. For me, luckily, I knew that these were long-term investments. These were buy and hold opportunities for me. And so when the market took a huge crash and the values dropped out from underneath me, I, it was frustrating, but I didn't worry about it too much because I knew that I was in it for the long run. I never planned on selling it. Just like my 401k during that time took a huge hit, 
that was okay because I wasn't looking to retire and pull money out of my 401k. And just like my 401k rebounded, so too did those real estate values. And those three homes that I bought at arguably the very worst time that you could buy an investment property, all three of those homes I sold for a profit about 10 years later. Um, now, there was challenges in the meantime, right? There was challenges in between. One thing that happened around 2010, 11, 12, at really the height of the foreclosures is the rental market got really soft. And although I told you I wasn't really thinking about cash flow when I bought these and I was okay with a little bit of negative rent, you guys, some of these houses, the negative rent was substantial. Uh, I wasn't able to rent some of them for half of what the mortgage payment was. And that was probably the most difficult period for me is I had over, I don't know, it was a couple thousand dollars a month in negative rent. So I was writing a check to hold on to real estate that was negative equity. And at the time, you can understand why a lot of people uh, let their homes go into foreclosure. But for me, my credit and the commitments that I made were the most important thing. So I persevered. And luckily, those homes were on uh, adjustable rate mortgages. I know a lot of people are afraid of adjustable rate mortgages. They're not all bad, especially the ones that are available today. But most of those homes I bought on five-year arms. So I bought them in 06 and 07. And by 2012, they were adjusting off of the five-year fixed period and interest rates were really low. And all of a sudden, I went from a negative cash flow situation to a positive cash flow situation. And then I was making money every single month. Houses were still underwater, but I was making money every single month. And if I look back at this journey, it all it all balanced out. You know, the negative rents that I paid, luckily I had enough income to cover those. And then when I started making cash flow on those, it more than made up for it. And in the 10 years, um, those house values dropped significantly the first few years and then did nothing but recover uh, for the last five years. And, and like I said, made a profit on all those. So man, I, I think what I want to get across to you guys is owning real estate's a journey and you never know what is going to happen. Now, I don't think that we're ever going to see, I don't want to say ever, but I don't think any time in the near future, we have the circumstances that could have home values drop as much as they did in 2008. I just don't see that. If you look at the demographics of what's happening, the the number of homeowners, the number of millennials that are, you know, even as, as early as 28 years old, but that cohort of 28 to 40 year olds, you guys is gigantic. And the amount of homes available for them is still very anemic. And so regardless of what happens with interest rates, we're going to have a strong demand for housing for years to come. So that should give you some level of confidence that you won't repeat what I went through. But it doesn't change the fact that there's a lot of unforeseen things that can happen in your journey of owning rental properties. And so one of the things that that is necessary when you qualify for a mortgage to buy an investment property is you have to have reserves. And there's a minimum amount of reserves. Usually it's six months of reserves for the property. If you own multiple properties, maybe you need reserves for each of your properties. It really depends on the mortgage solution that you provide. But this is an area where I cannot understate how important it is to have reserves and be prepared for you know, what you might not see coming. Uh, during that journey of owning those homes, I had a number of times where I had vacancies that I, I didn't expect. I had tenants who, you know, didn't pay the, the, the rent on time. And um, as a result, I had to, you know, not only be negative rent in some cases, but then cover uh, months of rent before I, you know, they got either got those caught up or I had to evict them. I had situations where I had homes that were pretty severely damaged by a tenant. And you can expect every time a tenant moves out, you're going to lose at least a month, if not two months of rent, because, you know, the tenant has moved out. And in many cases, you're going to have to do, you know, touch up the paint, maybe replace the carpets, go in and fix, you know, potentially some appliances or some other things. And this happens almost every, every time. And so when we do a session here talking about, 
being a landlord, we're going to talk about how do you create situations where you don't have heavy turnover with your tenants? Because every time someone moves out, it, it costs you money um, for usually, in my experience, two months, uh, almost every time, even with great property management and all the right things. Um, you know, you, you almost never go a, a month, but in my experience, two months of having to cover that mortgage payment. And, um, and, and then there's always some repairs. So that's what I've learned there. Now, the next kind of area that I've dabbled in with real estate is buying and fixing, uh, you know, fixing and flipping homes. And again, you know, um, Every one of these has turned out to be okay, but every one of them has been a journey. You know, it's had its own challenges that I didn't expect. Uh, I purchased uh, a, a home that was, um, you know, in pretty bad disrepair. That's what you're looking for, right? When you're do doing a fix and flip, you want something that's cosmetically in fairly rough shape so that you can, you know, make those improvements and realize those gains. Um, but for me, there's been times where there's things that were not foreseen, even by a home inspection. And I have a great home inspector and, you know, they can call out a lot of things. And in this case, you know, they did call out challenges with the roof, but I thought that I was going to be able to do some repairs, maybe spend five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000, have the roof repaired. And it turned out that I needed to replace the whole roof for $45,000, $50,000 to tear off this tile roof and, and do all the repairs that were needed. Um, there was a, a, a very simple um, uh, you know, wall that I was gonna remove and I was gonna remove this fireplace and, 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 and make the kitchen a little bit bigger. And when we dug into it, we realized that the bathroom that was uh, behind that wall had a pretty significant water leak and it created a lot of damage that we had to repair. And the list goes on of things like this where there's unforeseen things that you may not be aware of. Right at the very end, I got ready to sell the property and we realized there was challenges with the septic system, uh, didn't pass inspection. And all of a sudden at the very end, you know, another five, $6,000 of expenses that, uh, that came up. And so, you know, I don't say this to scare you away from investing in real estate. Matter of fact, I, I still invest in real estate today. I'm actively looking for another property that I can fix and flip. And as I mentioned, through all of this, I've never had a real estate investment, whether it be a primary residence, something I converted into a rental or a fix and flip where I lost money. I've never lost money, but I've maybe not made as much money as I expected or I found myself in a situation where I had to hold on to the property longer than I expected to. I had to maybe contribute um, more financially to the maintenance of the property, whether that be because of vacancies, home you know, improvements that needed to be made, or just simply the numbers just didn't add up the way that I thought that they would. And so I think that it's important that if you're gonna be a real estate investor, a few things that I would mention, you can't do it on a shoestring budget in my opinion. I, I love to see more people own homes, but the people that end up getting into big trouble, the people who end up going into foreclosure or having their real estate investment completely ruin their financial situation are people who are not prepared for the unprepared, you know, the things you, you, you can't prepare for. And the only way that I know of to do that is to have a reserve. Uh, or the ability to tap into a reserve. And maybe that's, maybe you own a home today and maybe that's having a home equity line of credit that's available that you can tap into in, a, in an emergency if you're gonna invest in real estate. Or maybe it's knowing that you have access to, you know, a retirement fund. Not something that you would ever wanna tap into um, if you didn't have to, but something that's like that reserve that gives you that, uh, that safety net, if you will, if things go wrong so that you can get yourself out of a situation and be prepared that even if it's a fix and flip, you know, this last home, I got really fortunate. I fixed it up. We did a great job on the renovation. And uh, this was a home that was just over a million dollars. And you'd think in today's market, I mean, this literally is just sold in the last 30 days. Um, you know, we listed that home on a Friday, we got an offer on a Monday and, uh, and, and it sold very quickly, but I was prepared to keep that home as a, a rental. If I needed to, I was prepared, you know, to have contingency plans if I needed to, in order to deal with things not going right. And, and that's what I would encourage you to think about 
as you're investing in real estate. So look, that's the truth about real estate. The truth is for me, it's been a, it's been a, I don't want to say a bumpy road, but it's been, you know, it's had its ups and downs, you know, things haven't always gone great. I'll tell you one thing that did go great. Um, this will be a, a bright way to end this podcast. I bought a home, um, kind of on a whim, you know, we, we bought a second home down in, um, Palm, Palm desert, uh, in Indio. And I bought it because, uh, you know, we live here in the Pacific Northwest and it's just like it is right now. It's very cloudy and rainy and we like to get out and get some sunshine in the winter. And so we bought this home. We were just going to go on a vacation, but uh, a house came available. A friend of mine said, hey, do you want to be my neighbor? And I said, sure, you know, uh, and I kind of bought it on a whim. Um, but that home we owned for four years. I put zero money into renovations. I mean, we decorated it and, you know, made it nice, but zero money into renovations. We had it as a second home for four years and we sold it for more than double what we paid for it. And, uh, the only thing that bad came out of that situation is the amount of, uh, uh, taxes that I had to pay both to the state of California and for, uh, the gains on that property. But I say that jokingly, I love paying taxes because that means that we made money, but look, there are situations like that where it just turns out perfect. You know, um, the reason I doubled my money on that, because it was right at the time where the bidding wars were happening and we actually listed that home and got an offer for $125,000 over the asking price. Like that's unforeseen. Even the giant ups sides that I've seen in real estate, they weren't predicted, you know, and that's really the point of the story is that there's a lot of things that you don't consider and none of them, um, none of them are small, even, even in, in that particular case to get an offer for $125,000 over asking price, like that's in, insanity, but it's because you're dealing with such big numbers that, you know, that was you know, a, a small percentage of, well, in that case, I guess it was a pretty big percentage, but you know, it was, it was about 10% or, uh, you know, over asking price, 15% over asking price. Um, but the numbers get huge, you know, when you, when, when, you're, when you're talking about real estate and the expenses can get huge. So you guys, those are some things to just consider as you think about real estate. I've never had a bad experience where I lost money, but I've learned a lot of lessons and luckily you know, I was able to shift my time horizon. I was able to, you know, adjust my budget if necessary in order to bridge some financial gaps. And those are the things that you need to be prepared for as you think about investing in real estate. Um, it, it's not something that I believe you can get into. Um, a lot of people will talk about how you can invest in real estate with no money. Look, there, there are some ways of getting into properties with low down payments, but that's not the whole story. You have to be able to deal with the unforeseen challenges that are going to come. And if you're not careful, investing in real estate, although it can be a huge opportunity, can just as easily take someone out and financially, I mean, and impact other areas of your life. So don't take it lightly consult with professionals, you know, work with a great real estate agent, work with a great mortgage professional, reach out to someone, reach out to me if you want. And, you know, talk about what are the potential, um, things th that you're not thinking about that could derail your goals in, in, re in real estate investing. This is not to say it's not a good idea. I think it's a great idea. It's been great for me. Um, but go into it with eyes wide open, know the potential, downfalls, be prepared to deal with those and even be prepared to deal with some that you didn't see coming. So you guys, uh, that's a little bit about my journey in real estate, my truth about real estate. Um, and I hope that you took away something from this. If you know someone who wants to be a real estate investor or who's looking at purchasing their first investment property, maybe share this episode with them and uh, not to scare them, but to give them some things to think about some food for thought as you go on down this journey of being a real estate investor. And until next time, you guys, thanks for your time and attention. Take care.